Thank you very much. It is uh, an honor to be here. I'm just glad that I'm here this week and not last week. Last week you had on Tuesday Buddy Gray, and I hope you had a chance to hear Buddy. Uh, Buddy was the past my pastor while I was in Birmingham, Alabama, and uh, is, uh, is a brilliant pastor and a wonderful Christian man. If ever you find yourself in Birmingham and you're thinking, where should I go to church? The answer is Hunter Street and with Buddy Gray, just a tremendous man of God uh, that is, he was well worth getting to know. I'd invite you to take your, either your copy of God's Word or your tele or your phone or your tablet or whatever device you've got um, and turn with me to the book of Isaiah. And Isaiah into the fifth chapter, Isaiah chapter five. On the way here, Bruce Ashford reminded me that really Isaiah 6 is where all the action is, but I missed that. So we're in Isaiah 5 uh, this, this morning. Isaiah chapter 5. I'm going to read for you. You can follow along the first seven verses, although I'll have uh, reason to, uh, to make reference to uh, various parts of the, of the whole chapter of Isaiah 5. Follow along as I read from Isaiah chapter 5 beginning at verse 1. Let me sing for my beloved my love song concerning his vineyard. My beloved had a vineyard on a very fertile hill. He dug it and cleared it of stones and planted it with choice vines. He built a watchtower in the midst of it and hewed out a wine vat in it, and he looked for it to yield grapes, but it yielded wild grapes. And now, O inhabitants of Jerusalem and men of Judah, judge between me and my vineyard. What more was there to do for my vineyard that I have not done in it. When I looked for it to yield grapes, why did it yield wild grapes? And now I will tell you what I will do to my vineyard. I will remove its hedge and it shall be devoured. I will break down its wall and it shall be trampled down. I will make it a waste. It shall not be pruned or hoed and briars and thorns shall grow up. I will command the clouds that they rain no rain upon it. For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel and the men of Judah and his pleasant planting. And he looked for justice and behold bloodshed, for righteousness, but behold an outcry. Our gracious heavenly Father, we do pray that this morning as we consider your word, Lord, we ask that this would not be just another time where we gather together in the week, that this would indeed be a rich time in which, Holy Spirit, you would come and minister the gospel to us, for there is none here who is above or beyond the need of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Oh, Lord, we pray that you would apply this word to us. We pray that you would open our eyes, that we would see you clearly high and lifted up, and we would have ears to hear your message. Transform us, we pray, that we might this day be all the more made into the image of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Take away any impediment, any distraction, Lord, that we might concentrate fully on what you would have to say for us. And we ask these things in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. You'll notice here in Isaiah chapter 5, Isaiah begins by saying, let me sing to my beloved. And then after he sings, he has this story. It reminded me of a friend of mine who I, with whom I ministered for some time in the Republic of Ireland. He himself had been, before he was an evangelist in Ireland, he had been a professional singer. And, uh, and one of the things he did when we were in Ireland is we would go around different towns and we would be preaching on the streets and ministering to people and calling them to repentance and all that wonderful stuff. There we were and, and he, he did something I'd never seen before. He stood up and as the people were passing by in this, this busy street, it was a pedestrianized zone, there were people everywhere. He said, you know, one thing occurs to me, and that is that wherever I go, no matter where you go in all the world, there, is, there are two things that are true of everyone. The first thing is everyone loves a song. The second thing is everyone loves a story. And because he was a wonderful singer, he was able to lift up his voice in song, and he did that. And, and he began to sing a beautiful song. And as he sang, sure enough, all kinds of people stopped, and they wanted to hear him sing. And he sang this, this song, and he drew in the crowd. And then he moved very seamlessly from that song into a story. And he began to tell a story. And as he told the story, even more people gathered. And he had a massive crowd. And of course, at just the right moment, He was able to turn all of that towards the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I marveled that he was not only his skill, but I marveled at the fact that he's exactly right. Everyone loves a song. Everyone loves a story. 
That's exactly what Isaiah has done here. Isaiah the preacher, not just the prophet, but Isaiah the preacher here has begun with a song and he has moved seamlessly into a story, in this case, a parable. And it's wonderful to think about parables, isn't it? I mean, you, we all know parables. We, we are aware of them from reading the Gospels, especially where Jesus told so many parables. And we know the purpose and point of parables, don't we? A parable is a story, it's made up. It's not reflecting history in the sense that these events actually happen, but it's a story, a fiction, dare I say, in which, in which the, the, the teller of this story is drawing people in. And the whole idea is that people will connect with some point in that story. They'll be drawn in with agreement or they'll be drawn in with, with amazement or they'll be drawn in with, with despair and the, the, the feelings of the person in the parable. And then at just the right moment, the purpose of a parable is that it suddenly turns and you realize, oh, oh, that's what the story's about. And so often the story is about moi, as you say in the South. It's about me. Perhaps the most famous parable, uh, well, at least one of the most famous parables is the parable of the prodigal son. You remember Jesus telling this story in Luke chapter 15. And, and you remember that in Luke chapter 15, it begins, Luke chapter 15 begins with Jesus being in the midst of those who are, who are sinners, those who are tax collectors, those who are the rejects of the religious society and the leadership. And that's their complaint at the beginning is, is, is that the Pharisees can't believe that Jesus is spending time with these people. Why would he do this? Doesn't he know who they are? Doesn't he know who they represent? And they're grumbling and they're complaining. And we read that Jesus, knowing this, began to tell a series of parables. And the last one in Luke 15 is the parable of the prodigal son. And of course, we know how that parable goes, don't we? That there is that son who says, I've had enough. I'm going to go and party like I want to. This is after all, I was told in the song from the 1980s, this is exactly what I should do. And so the son goes to the father and says... I want my reward, I want my inheritance, I want what's coming to me. And the father, in a tremendous act of grace, turns to his son and says, okay, here it is. If one of my sons came to me and said, I want what's coming to me now, I want my inheritance, I'd say, son, you already have it, get out. <laughs> but not this father. This father is gracious. This father is kind and he actually, he does this. Of course, the son, as we know, goes off and he spends it in all sorts of the wrong ways. He, he, he thinks he's making friends, but apparently he thinks all is going well. Of course, he ends up with no money and there he is with nothing. And what does he do? In the midst of all of that, the son recognizes that he needs to go back to his father, but how does he go back? He doesn't know how to go back. And one day he's sitting there in the town of the city far away and he says that he recognizes, you know, I would be in a better place if I just ate what the pigs had to eat. And let's face it, any time you've got an opportunity to eat with a hog, you really should. It's a wonderful experience. It's fantastic. It's great. So I don't know what the complaint is. But apparently that was a bad thing. Uh -huh. Who knew? <laughs> Last time I went to Israel, I was a little bit nervous, you know, being a hog, being a pig, going into a land that's, where it's not kosher. It's a bit nervous, you know, getting through there. But I got through and I came back. It's okay. Anyway, I digress. Um, where was I? Yes, so we have the, the, the prodigal son. There he is. And so he goes back to his father and thinks, I'll just go back as a servant, not even a son. He comes back and, of course, the father greets him. He, he kills the fattened calf. They have a party. The older son can't believe this. The older son, as you know, says, what's going on? And he won't even enter into the room. He won't go into the house. Why won't he go in the house? Because he can't believe this profligate. He can't believe this, this other brother of his who, who wasted all his father's money is there. And he's grumbling and complaining because the father has been merciful and forgiving and kind and gracious. And it's amazing that the parable doesn't end there. It ends with the father saying, why shouldn't I? You've already had everything. You've got, the, you've got a goat, you've got a fatted calf if you want it any time you want. You, 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 you should know that. He was lost and now he's come back. We should celebrate. And then it ends. And it ends, I think, because Jesus wants the Pharisees to ask themselves the question, wait a minute, what's this parable about? This parable is, hold on, so the, the, the father is the divine figure here. Whether it's God the Father or God the Son, it's the divine figure who is incredibly gracious towards who? Towards sinners. And who, are, who then is the older brother? The older brother is the grumbler, the complainer who refuses to be kind and gracious and merciful. Oh, wait a minute, that's, that's us. And so the parable ends like that because Jesus is waiting to find out, will you identify yourself 
Will you see yourself in this? And will you recognize that you are in fact in the wrong? So there is, there's the parable, we love that parable. And here too, Isaiah does a wonderful job with the parable, doesn't he? Isaiah weaves together both song and parable as he, as he walks through this text. This parable is incredible, and we don't necessarily appreciate this one as well as, as, as the prodigal son. Because most of us, I would imagine, most of us are not accustomed to farming. We're not accustomed to digging. We're not accustomed to the labor on, on in the, the laboring in the ground and so forth. When we want grapes, we simply go to the grocery store and hey, presto, they're there. We're the foggiest idea how they got there. We did, amen, that's it, that's it, bring it on, yes. Of course, we have no idea how this happens. But of course here, what do we read? We read that this man dug a vineyard. Now, I know you're all Baptists, so you've never even contemplated grapes or what you might do with them. I get that, that's fine. That's fine, I understand, I understand. But you may have driven past a vineyard sometime in your life and, and because of your sin, you actually looked at it and then you look back. <laughs> and you thought, no Lord, forgive me for I have seen a vineyard. What am I to do? But anyway, if you've seen a vineyard, if you're willing to admit that, I won't ask for a show of hands, but if you've seen one, you know they're large, right? It's not like the garden that's at the back of, you know, my house or whatever, you know, someone's house that, you know, is all of 10 by 10 or something. It's really small. No, 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 that's not how a vineyard works. This thing is acres and acres and acres and acres. So in the parable, here is a man who decides to dig a vineyard. That's a lot of digging because it's one man with a shovel. He doesn't have anything. There's nothing about servants here. There's nothing about anybody. This man is doing all the work. He's doing all the heavy lifting. And if you have been to Israel, you'll also know that Israel has stones everywhere. The Jews even have jokes about all the stones in Israel, about how they got there and what's going on there and why they're there and why they won't go away. All this sort of, there's lots of stones. So here is this man, he is digging in the vineyard. He is clearing the stones. And of course, everyone in Isaiah's congregation is saying, oh, yeah, we know that. We know what it is to dig and dig and dig. We know what it is to move all these stones. It takes a while. Then in verse five, we read as, as the judgment falls, we read that the, the man built a, a, a wall around the vineyard. He built a hedge, he, he grew a hedge around it. He is protecting this. That's a lot of work. You've got a wall that could be, who knows? It could be a mile long in total circumference. We don't know, but it's a big wall. It's a big job. He builds a watchtower. Again, maybe out of the stones that he's dug up, he builds a watchtower. He goes and he gets the choicest vines, which means it spares no expense. And there is, he digs and plants each one and according to the, the line in which he's got them and he's got the strings and however else you do all this, all this stuff and he's planting it. And then he eventually builds his wine vat so he's prepared for when these grapes come. And I know nothing about growing grapes, but it turns out in looking into this that it takes from when you plant a vine in the ground and you want grapes, you have to wait at least three years. Now everybody in Isaiah's congregation knows this. So they know that this is an investment not just of I'll plant in May and I'll harvest in September. This is no, I'll plant in May and maybe three years from now I'll see some fruit. It's gonna take some time, it's gonna take some work. And so all of this is going on. Isaiah's congregation knows this. They're tracking with him saying, oh, this is incredible. This man has done all this work. He's built this wall, he's built this watchtower. He's, he's planted these vines. And then at the end of verse two, it doesn't yield the kind of grapes that are wonderful and succulent and, 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 and the, the evidence of God's goodness. No, instead, wild grapes. How did that happen? Sour, horrible, wild grapes that are utterly useless. And at that moment, because the people, you can just hear the collective groan of Isaiah's congregation. Oh, I can't believe all that work, all that time. I've done that sort of work, they might say. But this is terrible. And then in verse three, Isaiah draws them in further. In fact, I believe this is where uh, the voice of the Lord becomes uh, the, the dominant voice here. And now on inhabitants of Jerusalem and men of Judah, verse three, judge between me and my vineyard. What more could I have done for it? And the people would have been sitting there thinking, absolutely nothing. You did everything you could do for it. And he carries on and says, not only that, but when, when I looked at it, it yielded nothing. And so he's inviting them. And then in verse five, he says, well, I will tell you what I'll do to my vineyard. And they say, oh yeah, tell us, brother, tell us. Because they're not as stodgy as you are. So far, you're not engaging me very much here. Come on, <laughs> expect a little more, expect a little more. But there he is and, he, and he's saying, and, and in verse five, he's saying, I'll tell you. And they said, tell us, tell us. What, I'm gonna tell you what I'm gonna do to the vineyard. I'm gonna remove its hedge. And they go, an amen from the back. And, I shall be, and it shall be trampled down and I'll make it a waste. Oh yeah, brother, carry it on, come on. Yeah, that's right, that's right. And I will command the clouds that they will not rain upon it. Yes, indeed, they shouldn't. After all, this is a total waste. And they're all there, yes, amen, I get it. And then verse seven, for the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is who? It's you. Oh, 
well, I, you know, maybe I was a bit harsh and judging and saying amen and yeah, tear, you know, tear it down and, and erase it and all the rest. I, oh, I see. So, so what are the grapes, Lord, that you were hoping to get? What's the fruit? The end of verse seven, I looked for justice and instead I got bloodshed, the exact opposite. Looked for righteousness and instead I got an outcry from those who are being oppressed. You see, what's true of Isaiah five is true of the prodigal son. Those who thought they knew God prove that they know nothing of him. They know nothing of this God. They may have lived in his presence and they may have lived and, and gone to, to, to tabernacle or they may have gone to the temple or they may have gone to synagogue, they may have gone wherever all throughout history, but they're proving they know nothing of him. Now this should disturb you just a little bit. You should get at least a little bit uncomfortable sitting in your seat. Why? Well, let's think about each of these parables. If you think about the Pharisees in Luke 15, what do we know about the Pharisees? The Pharisees attended synagogue. They were in the temple every week. They were in church every Sunday. Last statistics I, I, I uh, read were only about a week ago. They're apparently the regular attender in the average evangelical church, and I know statistics are kind of weird, but the average attender, regular attender of an, of an evangelical church in the United States of America goes to church 1.9 times per month. Pharisees are doing better than evangelicals and they're in trouble. Again, it depends on the statistics you read. I get this, but we know from the gospels that the Pharisees would tithe 10% of what they had. The average evangelical tithes 2%. Oops. So much, so far the baddies are doing better, it would seem, at least in certain outward acts, than the evangelical church today. Well, what about the people of Isaiah's day? We're not in Luke 15, we're in Isaiah 5. So let's not, you know, compare ourselves to those. Let's, let's look at what's going on there. Well, if we read the rest of chapter 7, I'll just highlight a few verses. It's interesting, isn't it? The picture we get. Look at verse 8. What do we read? We read in verse 8 that the people were joining house to house and adding field to field. And we know from this, from the, what we can read in Kings and so forth, that this was a wonderful time of prosperity. This was a time in which people could add to what they already had. This was a time in which people had a disposable income. This is a time when people had savings accounts. This is a time when people could invest and expect a return. This is a good thing. And what's happening here, the people are saying, yes, this is a wonderful, prosperous time. This is a wonderful, prosperous country. It's not perfect, but it's wonderful. And it's a sign of the blessing of the Lord. And what does God say in verses eight and nine? He actually tells them, and 10 even, he condemns them for it and says it's got nothing to do at all with prosperity nor my blessing, it's got everything to do with your greed. You think all is well, but I'm telling you, you are mistaken. You thought your prosperity was a blessing and in fact it's greedy and I have no delight in it and it will come to an end horribly. Then of course we see verses 11, 12 and, and 22, we can throw in there as well. It's the same, same idea here. What do we see here? That people are, it says, woe to those who rise early in the morning that they may run after strong drink and they stay up late at night and they, they have their parties with their lyres and their harps and their tambourines and their flute and wine and all the rest of it. I'm sure those people thought, well, of course, why not? We should be pursuing pleasure. It's a good thing to pursue pleasure, isn't it? God is a God of pleasure. God is a God of good gifts. We should enjoy these things. He has blessed us. We're prosperous. We've got this. Let's enjoy it. And God says, no, not only is that greed, but that's also hedonism. What they thought was one thing, God is now correcting and saying, no, it's another. Verses 18 and 19. What do we see there? It talks about those who, who draw iniquity with cords of falsehood, who draw sin as their cart rope, and they say, let him be quick. Let him speed his work that we may see it. Let the counsel of the Holy One of Israel draw near and let it come that we may know it. It's a mocking, even I was trying to read it, it's a mocking voice. And I don't doubt that they thought to themselves, well, we are a people who are intelligent, we are well-educated. We can listen to the preacher and decide whether he's right or not. We can sit here and determine whether, and of course the whole time what Isaiah is saying is, no, you have no idea. You're not in fact well-educated, you're just arrogant. You think you've got a well-educated understanding of the world and you can critique things and take what's good and leave what's bad and, and you can listen to sermons, you can listen to Bible studies and you can listen, dare I say, to lectures. And yet, it's nothing but a critical spirit. It's nothing but haughtiness. Then verse 20, we get another woe. There's woes everywhere here says that you call evil good and good evil, darkness light, light darkness, bitter sweet and sweet bitter. There is cultural relevance if ever there was. 
I will live in such a way that I am accepted by the world and that's what I want more than anything in the world. I will be accepted by the world and so if they say this is the way it should be, even if it doesn't square with scripture, that doesn't matter, I'm going to follow along. I'll do whatever it is the world says because I want to be culturally relevant. And then verse 21, the final woe, well, we already talked about 22, but the, the, the last the woe that we'll talk about here is to those who are wise in their own eyes, woe and shrewd in their own sight. Here are these who think they're so wise. Been around a long time, I've seen a lot of things, and I know I'm wise, I know I can make good decisions. And God says, no, you're a fool. You are a fool. So instead of being prosperous and enjoying pleasure and being a good critical thinker and being culturally relevant and culture and, and wise, God's picture and God's word to this people through this parable is that you are greedy and hedonistic and arrogant and immoral and you are fools. You see, the blinding effect of sin is that I don't always know what I think I know. The blinding effect of sin is that I don't always know what I think I know. Israel, Judah thought, we know we're prosperous. We know we have the pleasure of God. We know we have the blessing of God. We know we receive the gift of God. We know we live in the favor of the Lord. And God turns around and says, no, you don't. And he says, I'm going to come and I will, I will let I will not let rain fall anymore. I will destroy the wall. I will burn up and all the rest of it, the, the, the hedge and let the briars and thorns grow. You see, in Isaiah's day, just as in Jesus' day, I think I know God. I think I am drawing close. I think I'm growing in maturity. But if all of that is based on my estimation solely of my vertical relationship with God, that's the only thing I'm looking at when I'm determining whether or not I'm in fact growing in the faith and I'm a mature individual and I'm being obedient, if that's the only thing I'm looking at, then you're not looking at enough. You're not looking at enough. You see, an estimation, a good estimation, a proper estimation of my vertical relationship must include a sober assessment of my horizontal relationships. I cannot claim that I'm growing in mercy and grace and the favor of God when I'm ignoring and treating others poorly. We just saw a video, didn't we? We saw a video in which there were floods everywhere. We saw a video in which there were people in need. We saw a video with those who had lost everything. We saw a video of those who are waiting for help. And it's wonderful to know that we have those who will go on our behalf who maybe we can't do it, but we can help others go or we can go ourselves. My question is, are you part of that? Or have you become desensitized? Other people have problems? Well, so do I. Other people have issues? Well, so do I. Other people have needs? I'm a seminary student for crying out loud. I have no money. It's amazing how we can set aside our horizontal relationships and claim not to worry though, my vertical relationship, my relationship with the Lord is really in great shape. And God says here, absolutely not, because all the woes that he delivers are woes that have an impact and an effect on our horizontal relationships. He's saying the reason I know that you are not producing the fruit is because the horizontal relationships are in horrible affairs, in a horrible way. How I treat others is substantial evidence of how well I know God. How well I treat others is substantial evidence of how well I know God. Do not claim that you know the Lord because you are growing in a knowledge of the Word of God. Claim that you know the Lord because you are working very hard to be obedient to Him and how you treat others, how you love others, how you serve others, all those horizontal things. That's the evidence. If the learning that you have only ever remains in your head and the learning that you have only ever remains in the classroom and the learning that you have only ever remains in the church and the learning you have only ever remains in a Bible study room, then you have not learned anything and you do not know the Lord as you think you do. We must take sober assessment of our horizontal relationships. Let's look at each one of these again and think about them. If I haven't made you feel bad enough, I will endeavor to do more. Verse eight, we were talked about greed. Let me ask you this question. What is the effect of your buying habits on the poor? Now you may think to yourself, I am the poor. You live in America, you don't even come close. What are, your, what are the effect of your buying habits on the poor? I wanna make it clear here, God does not condemn the wealthy, but he does tie wealth to justice. He does tie wealth to justice. There is a responsibility in having 
So I ask you, how much thought do you put into how you use those resources? What do the companies from which you purchase your whatever it is you purchase, what do they represent? Do you think about this? Are they companies that treat their employees in a good way or do you really care because all you're interested in is a good deal? And you don't actually care about what that company is doing to give you the good deal. It doesn't matter if they have to you know, deal with poor people in another country badly. Who cares? It doesn't affect me. I don't know, maybe it does. If it affects your Lord, should it not affect you? There's greed. What about hedonism? Ah, the pursuit of pleasure. Is your pursuit of pleasure greater than all other pursuits? And alcohol here is a poignant illustration that sensual indulgence dulls spiritual perception. But do not bear thereby think that alcohol alone is the culprit. It definitely can be. As I say, it's a particularly poignant example because it does it so well. But you can gorge on so many things. If you're like me, you can gorge on Netflix. By the silence, either you're with me or you have no idea what I'm talking about. I don't know which. But we know what it's like. What is it we want to do? We want to escape. We've got papers, we've got exams, we've got, we've got you know, issues at church, we've got issues at home. What do you want to do? You want to sit down and just binge for hours on whatever your favorite show is. Why? Because you can escape. What is that doing? It is dulling your spiritual perception and you are denying the very power of God to be at work in your life. You're saying, you're not only saying to all of those problems and people, I want nothing to do with you. You're also saying, Lord, I don't want anything to do with you either. The very moment you should be on your knees praying to the Lord for wisdom and understanding and discernment and help and aid is the moment when you're turning to something else. Some of you, I'm sure you've heard it from this very staged many times before, but it worth, it's worth repeating again just because the, it's amazing. The numbers amaze me every time they come out. Pornography. Some of you are hedonistic in this way and you will indulge and indulge and indulge. And I know I can say this, that if you are doing that and it's a problem for you and you don't know where to turn, I promise you if you turn to Dr. Aiken, he will help you because you cannot live there. Arrogance. We've got greed. We've got hedonism. Arrogance. This is a particular problem, isn't it, as the further you get on in your education, all the way up to faculty members, it never goes away. It's always something we must be on the watch for. I cannot tell you the number of times where I've had students in the former when I was here before, students would come to my, my office and they would sit down at the end of a semester towards the time that they were graduating and say, I've been ruined. I think, well, that's good to know. We've invested so much in you. <laughs> You're ruined? I always knew what they were going to say because it happened so many times that they'd say, I'm ruined. I'd say, why are you ruined? They'd say, you know, before I came here, before I started to learn the Bible and theology and history and, and all of the things that I've, all the wonderful things I've learned here, I used to be able to sit in the Bible study, the Sunday school class, the small group in my church, and I enjoyed it. Now I sit there and I think, man, this guy doesn't know the word of God from, I don't know what. He's not, you know, he or she, they just don't know what they're talking about. I can't believe the things people say. And everyone's like, oh yeah, that's good, that's good. And I'm just sitting there thinking, no, it's not. You've ruined me. Indeed, that is where the beginning of the spirit of arrogance enters in. Do you not think that the Lord is still looking at you in that moment? I would say to students, does this, I know it applies to no one here because you're all so righteous, but the older students from long ago in the dark, in the dark ages, do you not think that the Lord could still be looking at you and saying, you still don't get it? Do you think you've actually arrived? You've studied for three years, four years. If you're in the special advanced program, seven. Be gracious, for the Lord is daily gracious to you. If any of you have ever preached a sermon, if any of you have ever taught a Bible study lesson, and then you've put it away, you've kept it somewhere, you've, you've been a file or, you know, in a, in a book somewhere, and then years later you come back to it, you know this feeling, oh my. This is why no one should ever be recorded. <laughs> you look at it and you think, what was I thinking? That should be the very moment at which you drop to your knees and say, thank you, Lord, and I know that the next time I preach I need to have that mentality. Who am I? Who am I? The immorality, accepting to, to fit in, the folly that takes place in verse 20, 21. 
There we see these two things and they are essentially a desire for self-reliance fitting in all of this. I'll let you figure out how it is that they apply to your life. I won't know all of those things. I trust the Holy Spirit. But there's something that catches my attention in Isaiah chapter five. I'm not a numerologist per se. In other words, I don't try and always find, you know, if there's a number in the Bible, I don't think there's always some absolutely critical investment in it. But there are numbers that mean something. And what catches my attention here in Isaiah 5 is that you have six woes. Do I do something with that? Do I not? I don't know, but I think it's interesting because the number of perfection is seven. And surely if God is judging them for their sin, he would want to make sure that he had seven. I don't know, but it's, maybe it's going too far. But then I discovered it wasn't going too far. You see, there are six woes in Isaiah 5, and the seventh comes in Isaiah 6, doesn't it? If you look there, if you still have your Bible open, look at Isaiah chapter 6. It's wonderful to read this incredible vision that the prophet Isaiah has when he sees the majesty and the glory and the holiness and the wonder and the righteousness and the purity of God. And in the midst of all of that, what does he say? He pronounces the seventh woe. Verse 5 of chapter 6, woe is me. I can see it now. Isaiah the preacher has preached, he has sung, he has told his parable in Isaiah 5, and there he has pronounced on the people, woe to you, 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 woe to you. And then the Lord appears to the preacher and the preacher says, woe to me. The problem isn't them. In Isaiah 6, Isaiah realizes the problem is me. Who am I to stand in judgment over anyone else? It is the Lord who stands in judgment over all. And the problem, the trouble in Isaiah's day, the trouble with God's people is not society and culture and politics and economics and family life and relationships, the trouble is himself. And that's why I think Isaiah 5 is so, Isaiah chapter 6 is wonderful as we read verse 5. Woe is me may be his pronouncement, but in the mercy and the grace of the father in the prodigal son parable. What do we read there in verse seven? Behold, as he takes this coal from the very mountain of God, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away, your sin is atoned for. In the midst of all the sin, in the midst of all the judgment, in the midst of all that is unrighteous in the people of God, and this is a word for you and me, some of you struggle with greed. Some of you struggle with hedonism. Some of you struggle with arrogance. Some of you struggle with immorality. Some of you struggle with folly. I suspect I struggle with them all, so I beat you. But here we are. And as I thought about this, I thought about Isaiah 5, and I thought about Isaiah 6. I thought about the people in their sin, be, and there they are in under judgment. And I thought about them in Isaiah 6, and I thought, here they are in need of the gospel. And Isaiah is the one who understands this more than any other, and he records it for us. I thought, you know, it's amazing the gospel grace that extends through all of Scripture. And I could not help but think that Isaiah 5 and Isaiah 6 is very much like Romans 7 and Romans 8. Romans 7, Paul is there say, basically saying, you know, here I am, woe is me, he's judgment, he recognizes that there's sin in me, the things I want to do, I don't do, the things I should do, I don't do, and he's all a big mess, and he understands it, and he understands the weight of the sin and the presence in his own life. Even though he, Paul knows I am no longer under the dominion of sin, he knows the presence of sin is still within me, and I wrestle with it, and I struggle with it, and I know that I fail. And then chapter 8, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. I think Paul was plagiarizing Isaiah. I think Paul was a good reader of Scripture and he knew that every time the Lord brought judgment upon his people's heads for their sin, he always brought with it that gospel grace and forgiveness. And it is my hope and prayer that you and I will recognize that even while we struggle with Isaiah 5 and Romans 7, we live in Isaiah 6 and Romans 8. We live with the vision of the glorious majesty and holiness of God because we are those who live in Christ Jesus. Gospel theology flows through all of Scripture. Judgment against sin is necessary, but condemnation against you can be removed when God intervenes. And you and I both know that when we came to faith, didn't we? 
we knew at that moment or close to it or somewhere around the time we were saved, we knew in some sense, in some nascent form, we knew that the condemnation of God was no longer mine. My question to you is, you, have you left that knowledge back when you were saved or do you continually invite God to intervene in your heart and mind? Do you continually invite him to intervene? Do you stand with Isaiah in desiring that the woes of your sin should be transformed into the worship of your Savior? And the only one who can do it is the God who sits on high and says and pronounces to you that in Christ your guilt has been removed, your sin has been atoned for. May we always live in that gospel grace. Our gracious heavenly Father, we do pray that you would be merciful to us. We know that we have been a people who, though we do not live under the dominion of sin, yet we still toy with it. We still play with it. And so Lord, we pray this morning that you would forgive us of our sins and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. For we know that when we confess our sin, you are faithful and just to forgive us our sins. And you are faithful to, to, to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. And so we claim that promise. And Lord, we pray that we would be a people who evermore live in gospel grace. When we read Isaiah 5, may we never stop at the end, but move straight into Isaiah 6. When we read Romans 7, may we never stop there, but may we know that we live in Romans 8. And may we be reassured that those who dwell in the palm of your hand can never be snatched away. And may we live like we are in the palm of your hand. We ask this in Christ's name, amen.